Could I ask the people who are going to be reporting back from the various uh, breakout groups, could I ask them to come up on stage? We have one. Helen, you're on your way. Yeah, okay. Do you want to leave, will I leave this here for you? If you want to report first. Are we going to be doing it from here? Are we going to do it from this? Where, uh, wherever you like. I mean, whatever, what would, I think, would it, otherwise you'll have to, well, I think it'd be pretty easier to do it from the, unless you prefer to do it. <laughs> Stunting is a problem which is caused by malnutrition, but it is a problem which can be solved. Shabano difunu kuti ansu zon sikunu kumalawi. Akutziwa program zimenewa 1000 special days. Tieni tikonjetsa kutolo putini mbira. Eh, koma chichewa is difficult for azungu. Eh, mama. Koma pepani azungu akuzungu lira mutu. Eh, ti. Koma tieni tikonjetsa kutolo pini mbira. Zikomoni. Kukula, kukula, kukula. Ndikulela, kwa 
Mumana Jagu, the Jamago, Sanubi Mogs in one eye. Any chill, Malawi woman, I didn't give you. Now you and Yen Chira Guanji, Pagabu Quinipida. I can go back to Amana, Paga, Quanita, Sakazi, Midi John de Amai. Tawia Kukuna Pamana, you jumped in. Somebody, anyone, Okay, sorry for this uh, slight delay in starting, but we're, we're about to commence now. Uh, this is the reporting back on the, um, on the workshop sessions, and I'm expecting people to be able to report back in, in brief terms, and probably, hopefully, taking about, about three minutes. We asked uh, people to uh, think in terms of discussing specific progress or achievements one challenge or bottleneck, and then next steps. So a, a, a really, I think, logical way to think about the different issues that we are we are uh, we were discussing. Now, I think we may still be missing a couple of people, a couple of rapporteurs, and if they are so missing, could they make their way to the stage as quickly as possible? But we're going to start anyway with, with we're going to go across as per the, uh, the, 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 the way the programs were set out, the program was set out. I'm going to start with, with, with Clara Praniol, please. Clara. Hello, is this working? Um, okay, so in session 1A, which was titled Financial Tracking, we discussed um, what is it that we mean by financial tracking, what do we want to track, and also where do we go from here. This was very much an exploratory session. Uh, there are many countries that have been carrying out uh, budget analysis over the last year and also using uh, different financial tracking methodologies to come up with an estimate of how much is being spent on nutrition in their countries. There is another session that was moderated by Professor Endang in the afternoon, which was more for countries that were commencing on this area. Um, so the idea was very much to put uh, what is happening on the table and see where do we go from here. In terms of achievement, um, I think for last year Global Nutrition Report, um, we didn't have any estimates on how much was spent on nutrition. And I think everyone has to take some credit in this room because this year in the 2015 Global Nutrition Report, there is more than 30 countries that pre presented a figure. So this is a massive achievement. It's a lot that was done in the last um, 12 months and we hope that we can build on this. Of course, there are many challenges. We have seen that there are different approaches and methodologies that countries and donors have used and they all present the strengths and limitations. And we want to say that, I mean, we need to be ambitious in terms of like what we want to track and how accurate we want to track it. But we also want these methods to be transparent and replicable. We don't want just like an static picture of all the little interventions and all the little on expenditure. We want something that we can actually do regularly. This is why it's called financial tracking and not just um, like a, a one stop, like a one picture um, um, expenditure uh, um, expenditure review. So there are, in terms of next steps, I think there are a lot of champions in these rooms, and there is a cry for harmonization of methodologies and approaches, um, harmonization of definitions and criteria. 
what we mean when we say that we're tracking resources on nutrition. For nutrition specific, there is a more broad consensus, like for nutrition sensitive, there's still some way to go in terms of um, having a clear criteria on defining what, what is nutrition sensitive and, and what isn't. The good news on this front is that we are already moving and we have created a technical group to actually harmonize the approaches and come up uh, with something that uh, can standardize uh, methodologies across countries and maybe correct for the different data formats that are coming in. And a bit more of a reflection on this front and as we go forward on this process because we have heard a lot of things on what people want and how we should go about it. You know, we want, we need to have a very detailed plan uh, that with like breakdown by activities and by line items and by sector and by program that we can then track. We need to have like cost estimates so that then we can uh, track against these cost estimates whether we're allocating enough money or not. We also want a mapping of all the stakeholders to be involved to make sure that we capture like government funds, donor funds, uh, civil society. And my view is that uh, while we recognize that there is a lot of uh, data missing, like as the process moves forward, it is more likely that we're going to move forward in a jigsaw puzzle uh, type of process where there is different corners and different initiatives happening in parallel and we iterate, we work together and in the end like we will have like this comprehensive picture with all the data points like so this is not like just a linear a linear process like you first do this you then do this you then do this like there is a lot of initiatives they all have their merit so let's work together to try to harmonize it and iterate the process to arrive to uh, to arrive to a uh, picture that we are all happy with thank you very much so we're going to progress like the crab forward <laughs> uh, next one is helen uh, Helen Connolly, who will be talking about the, agreeing on the common results framework for nutrition. Helen, please. So one of the first things that came out of this session was that um, well, the common results framework is one of the most important, or the most important element of nutrition programming. It's also one of the most, um, or the least understood, and probably our weakest link. Um, so I want to just say briefly what, the, what, what a CRF is and what a CRF isn't. I mean, we all want a magic tool for developing a common results framework, um, but there's not a standard formula because there's not a standard country. It really is country specific. Um, a CRF is simply a consensus document that lays out what are the goals for your country and how we're going to go and, and um, uh, how, how we take into account all the geographical integration, the conceptual integration, the pro programmatic complementary complementary to within the country to clarify the roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders who are contributing to, towards the common results framework. Sometimes it's called a multi-sectoral nutrition plan, sometimes it's called a national nutrition plan, sometimes it's a strategic plan or strategic framework. There are many names. The, the document itself, the common results framework, is really about um, how stakeholders come together to reach the common goals. Um, there were calls to identify some examples. Um, there are many of them on the Sun uh, Scaling Up Nutrition website. Um, if you look in the annual report that you can find at the Sun um, stand, uh, each country has a, a, a profile, a highlight, and you can identify some, some countries with the common results framework. Um, as an example, we've got Yemen, Rwanda, Nepal, Kenya, um, and then if you go on the Sun website, you can, you can go down from the country to the documents and take a look at them. And so you can get an idea of the, the variety of plans that are out there. Um, so as far as progress, since last year, um, we've, I've seen significant progress in, in how far um, people have gone towards bringing in more stakeholders. There was a talk of a high level of commitment across the countries um, and coordination. Um, there's an understanding, better understanding of country context uh, through the use of the data that are available, um, and there's a growing contribution of business. Um, there's also a lot of challenges. Uh, one that comes to mind is that we need a, not just common results, but we need a common language around nutrition, and all of the stakeholders need to understand that language and be speaking the same language and trying to reach the same goals. Um, there's tension between the old ways and the new ways of doing things. This is a, a very horizontal, horizontal pro, um, process for trying to, to plan, and we're so used to the vertical, um, the vertical process. Um, we need, there's still a need for external support. Um, crises, change of government, um, natural disasters are all affecting nutrition, and we need to make sure that we plan in a way that nu the nutrition programming continues. 
Um, engagement needs to be maintained throughout the process, not just in the planning phase, but through the implementation, through the cost process, um, through the, the evaluation, and then back again to inform the, the next phase of the nutrition plan. Um, lessons are that we do need high level of engagement. Um, we need to engage business platforms, not just business companies. Um, and we need, need to develop a clear understanding and agreement around the goals. We need to prioritize and focus. Um, we need more data, um, but we also need to make the best use of the data that we do have. Um, we need to make noise. I've heard that over and over and over. Um, we need to show ownership, advocacy, and then national pride around the results that we're achieving. Um, the next steps are really a call for further guidance. Um, the Sun Secretariat has started a concept note. It's in very draft form, but it is available uh, at the Sun booth, um, and comments are welcome. So if anybody has any vision around the Common Results Framework and how to produce guidelines that will, will ease um, some of the, the anxiety around what, what a Common Results Framework is and how to produce it, that would be very nice, it's very helpful. Uh, we need to collect, connect um, the local and the national levels. We, we, um, we've got a, a fairly good conversation going around at the national level, but we have to take that down to the district and then back up again, and they have to feed into each other. Um, and most of all, we have to never lose sight of what the goal is, and that is to improve uh, nutrition uh, throughout the countries. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. Uh, we're next going to talk about, uh, to the best, I think we're going to do this anyway, engaging and mobilizing the media for nutrition. Yeah, okay. And Enenya Firi from Zambia Civil Society. Thank you, Tom. So we had a very invigorating, very energetic uh, session on engaging the media. Uh, and I believe it's, it's to be expected when you have so many journalists in one room. So it was, it was really, really interactive and um, several issues just came out. How do we engage with the media and mobilize the media for nutrition? And how do we use the media as a conduit through which we can raise nutrition at a policy level uh, you know, to decision makers? But also how do we engage with the media to raise awareness and create demand at community level? So very many insightful uh, um, <coughs> you know, you know, feedback came from the journalists and um, it was a very, very exciting session. Now, with particular regards to specific progress that was being made, there was a lot that was spoken about investing, investing time, investing resources uh, with the, uh, in, into the media and engaging with the media and building trusting relationships with uh, media personnel. So we heard from Burkina Faso how, uh, for example, they steadily and slowly built a network of journalists and institutionalized this network of journalists uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the specific ministries and, and, and working with co uh, communications departments in the specific ministries that I identified uh, uh, several journalists who are now nutrition champions and reporting regularly on nutrition issues, advancing the nutrition dialogue throughout the country, which I thought was fantastic. We got also from Bangladesh who have uh, put together a handbook for journalists, so an issue of training was very important. Uh, journalists. Um, the key through which we you know, have this uh, nutrition dialogue sustained and communicated, the narrative of nutrition uh, is, is, is really uh, sustained and, and, and used through the journalists. And they need to know exactly what they are talking about. Uh, one guy was really <coughs> passionate and said, don't talk to me about stunting, stunting. What is stunting? How do I report stunting, for instance? Uh, how do I make it newsworthy? So make me understand. So uh, very good lessons coming out of Bangladesh who put together a small handbook that journalists could just pick up and, and, and clearly have the information that they require when it comes to reporting on some of these issues. Um. Also, we, we heard from Uganda, a very spirited uh, you know, contribution from Uganda who've invested time in bringing journalists out to the major cities and in rural communities. In a sense, just really bringing the story to the journalists so that as they report on these issues, they have a personal feel, personal touch on who is actually impacted by, uh, you know, by malnutrition. If they actually see these stories for themselves, it makes for richer reporting, it makes for more accurate spreading of the message and creating of the dialogue. Uh, but also, we did recognize a few challenges. Nutrition is still not a political issue. Uh, very many journalists in the room were saying it's quite easy to report on political things. There's something political is happening. I know it's very common in my country, uh, screaming headlines about political differences, differences between political parties. But how do we make you know, nutrition just as an interesting topic, uh, you know, engaging uh, specifically with journalists? And, 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 and a huge concern came out from the journalists saying nutrition is not very political yet. It's still a very rather boring topic to report on. It's not very interesting so how do we jazz it up a little bit and how do we repackage nutrition so that it becomes more and more interesting to report on for journalists which I thought was fantastic coming out of some of those um, 
uh, uh, reflections from the journalists themselves. Uh, but also, uh, we need to support the media with empirical evidence to demonstrate how nutrition impacts our families, uh, you know, how it impacts households, but most importantly, how it impacts the economy. And I think this ties back to the political theme. Once we start to understand and recognize through uh, that nutrition has an impact, not just personally on people's homes, but also on the impact on the economy and also an impact on, 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 on the political strength of the country, I think then it becomes a very interesting topic to report on. Then it becomes something that journalists can grab on. And something that came out really as a, as a challenge is, is, is uh, you know, journalists should, we should not chase journalists with information. Journalists should chase us, you know, with information on nutrition issues. And this really speaks back to the jazzing up of nutrition. How do we make it more interesting, more enticing? And, and, and I remember during that session, a personal, personal anecdote that uh, struck me was uh, a personal relationship I had with one of the journalists back at home in my my country, whom uh, I think at the time we were trying to engage with them, and maybe they didn't understand the issues on nutrition. And after a while, they came back to me and said, look, after having been trained, now I understand some of these issues, I, I must confess that initially I had saved you in my phone as not again. So every time, every time I called this journalist on nutrition issues, he looked at his phone and it was not again. So how do we jazz up the story of nutrition? How do we make it more interesting? So we, we, we are not the not agains in, 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 in this journalist phones. So I thought that was really interesting coming out of the session. Uh, but also, um, we need to understand what motivates journalists and acknowledge the challenges that they face in balancing the importance uh, of the issue with uh, the incentives that drives their work and you know the balance of their work. Because at the end of the day, journalists need to make money. I mean, there's newspapers need to make. They need to sell papers for them to remain afloat, for instance. But how do they continue to you know uh, generate an income and report on nutrition issues and spread the uh, the message on nutrition? Uh, so we need to be able to just really find that dynamic and just create that balance. Uh, uh, when engaging with journalists, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, but and as far as next steps, and there's some good news, um, you know, together we can make 2016 the year. Uh, you know, uh, our media work on nutrition operates on a different level. How do we engage with the journalists so that they can understand? How do we subtract the jargon? You know, how do we uh, make journalists understand as they spread this message about stunting without using all these highly technical nutrition terms so that they can get on the bandwagon also and begin to report on some of these issues more effectively and efficiently? Uh, and, and, and also, how do we forge new relationships and sustain new relationships with journalists? Because at the end of the day, remember, it's through uh, the media that uh, the, the, the narrative on nutrition is sustained and is progressed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I think we're still going according to the, uh, the sequence of the workshops, uh, but we're going to, uh, anyway, Mohammed Cech uh, Larak from Chad. And Mohammed, you're speaking, I think, about the issue of functional capacity, is that correct? Yeah, thank correct. you. Fantastic. Thank you, merci. Donc, nous avons eu ce matin droit à une session. I found this topic very interesting, so I'm going to uh, develop it. So the development of capacity. So there were presentations and also some moderators who worked very well. We had the possibility of uh, defining what the uh, strengthening of and development of capaci capacity is, uh, functional capacities, which are the implications, whether the development uh, is based on the individuals, which are the implications, which are the implications instead if we are considering organizations. So there's been a very, very enriching and interesting exchange of information on different tables. Everyone had the opportunity to present an experience from the perspective of the government, a social society, also the UN. And uh, we had a series of examples on the part of the parliament, uh, parliament members about uh, functional capacity scaling up for um, multi-sectoral platforms, civil society, communication, and other disciplines. Uh, so these were all um, experiments which were very rich, very interesting and useful. And we managed to understand which is the approach for what concerns the development of uh, uh, functional capacities. Uh, we also uh, gathered updates, definitions, Definitions. And so I will um, cover three points with you. The first one is the progress or the um, 
or what has been implemented, then uh, the challenges and the next steps. As I just said, we have uh, discussed uh, uh, thoroughly this morning, and at the end of the workshop, uh, we um, we reach a, a common understanding. So what is the development of functional capacity? So we all understood what the, the core of the issue is. So we need a more inclusive approach involving uh, um, different actors uh, and sectors and uh, um, pursued at different levels. We also have to um, foster a multi-sectorial uh, approach and not just for our concerns, capacities and knowledge. And uh, this calls for a specific approach and tools that go beyond the usual set of information we're provided with. So we always need to be updated and properly trained. Moreover, we notice that we can, al can also learn from other sectors. In this case, we're talking about nutrition, but this also applies to uh, many other disciplines. And this was a, a further very important element for what concerns the progress. As to the challenges, we must have a holistic approach. This means that the uh, capacity development process becomes more complex and calls for an alignment, a cooperation um, involving all the development uh, um, initiatives uh, concerning capacity. So we have to try and, and move together towards development in this respect. We must also have an integrated vision, so a common vision, a joint vision among the partners, and this is an ongoing process. We can start to implement this vision, but we have to continue to work on it because it's a very lengthy process. For what concerns the forthcoming steps, we have to build on the principles we covered this morning and validate them and achieve our goals. So we have to pursue to continue this dialogue beyond and after these workshops. Uh, we have to also validate and adapt what we have found. We also had to find the mechanisms and the opportunities uh, that would enable us to translate these principles into guidelines in order to ensure the success of initiatives for the development of capacities. And so after completing them, validating and implementing them, we had to try and translate them <laughs> into um, true guidelines and in order to uh, um, to be able to adjust, adjust them both in the um, medium and long term. So this is a summary. Cesco Branco from, from WHO. I'm not, I think it's about the country, is it country programming? you're talking about? No, we had a fantastic title. The session was called Accelerating the Data Revolution. Fantastic. Okay. So go. it's a very <laughs> dynamic group. It was a very dynamic group. And, and uh, we started by defining the gaps. Do you actually find the gaps in the Global Nutrition Report? It's four types of gaps. Number one, countries who are unable to report on the WHA targets. And something you'll find very striking is that, you know, there's still many, many countries who do not have enough data on weight and height of child, children under five, particularly high income countries. And then a lot of countries who do not report on breastfeeding. Everybody should be able to report on breastfeeding. It's really basic. Number two, we're missing information on policies and coverage of effective intervention, let alone the issue of quality of delivery of intervention. We, we miss that data. Third, uh, we have perhaps a bit of a stronger set of data from health, but we definitely need data from other sectors, particularly agriculture and social protection. And number four, in general, there's a concern about quality of data. Uh, Global Nutrition Report 2015 it says it's a bit better than Global Nutrition Report 2014. Maybe we're better to look for the data or to, to liaise with the different uh, sources of data. So that's what the problem is. So what do we need to do? We need more data, we need better data, and we need better use of the data. And what was the group uh, thinking about it? So um, you know, how do we get better, uh, more data? We need to have good nutrition information systems in countries. So it's not about multiplying surveys. It's about having different ways to get the data, and in fact, trying to rely uh, more and more on routine data collection, or how can we integrate the surveys and routine data collection. There are, of course, 
problems of methodologies. Uh, we need to um, somehow use some ways of making them compatible and, and uh, reinforcing one another rather than contradicting. There is good experience, and that's a good uh, news, uh, certainly in Central America. We heard good experience from Senegal. West Africa is doing a good job in developing this nutrition information system. It's really important to have data collected at a good interval. I mean, Bangladesh, we heard an example, I mean, they're doing it uh, uh, six times a year. Maybe that, that's a lot, but uh, trying to go at least for twice a year and, and taking into account of the seasonal changes is something uh, that it's important to do. So more data with, through uh, a better system and multiple sources of information. Better data, that's where we can do a lot. Um, first of all, we need to have harmonized and prioritized indicators in different areas, in health and food security. And these indicators should be actionable. So we need not only indicators on nutritional status, but we need indicators on program and policy implementation. So we need process indicators. A good starting point is what the World Health Assembly has approved, so all countries have subscribed to the Global Nutrition Monitoring Framework. Uh, it doesn't cover all the areas, so, so you know, we can uh, also add to that, but that's a very good starting point. So once we have these um, indicators all clearly uh, adopted by all countries with a similar definition, with similar ways to collect information, we need to strengthen the capacity of health workers. We also need to think of other providers of data. So it's not only about health workers, but it could be others. It could be, uh, for example, people in the education system, teachers in school. It could be agricultural extension workers. So we need to have other sources of information, including the clients of the services, for example, who might transfer the information about uh, the quality of services through now modern technologies such as mobile phones. We also need, to a certain extent, better instruments. For example, basic things like, like me measuring the length of a child, there could be other ways, better ways to do that so with, with uh, less of an error and uh, uh, you know, making it the life it to, of the measures uh, easier. We also need to have better ways to uh, transmit and to analyze the data. And again, um, modern technologies, IT technologies may help there. Third point, in fact, is not the last one, but it probably is the most important one, is the better use of the data. So um, this is about uh, decision makers, so communicating to decision makers, but also communicating to the communities, to so returning the data to the communities. And this is not just uh, you know, for ethical reasons, but it's actually to make sure that decisions are made and funds are allocated based on a good analysis of the situation. So, uh, in fact, the decision makers uh, part is where the whole process starts from. You know, they uh, request data and we provide the data at a given interval because they expect the data at the given interval. And perhaps final point is to have a good advocacy on the use of the data, on the value of the data. So the way to communicate, to extract uh, data and communicate in an efficient, uh, easy to understand way is also a secret to um, more interest uh, uh, towards the data. So I think we, we close with a very optimistic um, note of uh, a lot of very good experience uh, collected in uh, uh, the countries of the Sun Movement. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive uh, account uh, and indeed optimistic account, Francesco. We're next moving then to, to Maureen from Uganda. Maureen. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Ladies and gentlemen, session 1F uh, was titled Discovering the Sun Movement and it focused on looking at the evolution of the Sun Movement in our countries, the roles of the Sun networks as they support our countries to implement the objectives of the Sun, and how the Sun countries have been working in actual terms uh, to take forward uh, the Sun uh, approach. Uh, Chairperson, the discussion revealed that most of our countries, especially those in the session, have embraced the, embraced the multi-sectoral approach to nutrition, and most of them, or all of them, indicated that they have put in place a coordination mechanism that goes beyond the traditional approach of looking at health and agriculture as the pillars of nutrition. 
We also discussed and it, it came to light that in our countries there is commitment at a high level and a coordinating entity with convening mandate has been put in place uh, to take forward the agenda. In the countries that presented, especially Zimbabwe and, and Nepal, it was revealed that there has been alignment of different actors, especially at the national level, to take forward the sun uh, movement and, and promote nutrition. And nutrition now is featuring in our country's policy and planning frameworks, and action is cascading from the center towards the local level, especially uh, towards community level. The countries in the room also are promoting community-based approaches to implementation, especially uh, towards building resilience at the local level. The discussions also agree pointed towards the fact that the sun movement is perceived as a catalyst to action in our countries. It provides space for sharing and is a point of reference. Many uh, views were to the uh, agreed that it, it generated momentum to action in our countries, the sun movement. We also agreed that our countries uh, can put in place a coordinating mechanism that is unique to the circumstances of our countries or that works in our countries. In terms of progress, there was a lot of achievements that were discussed, but um, it was agreed that implementation of nutri nutrition programming is ongoing, and Nepal and Zimbabwe and other countries shared that there has been actually impact and their nutrition indicators in terms of stunting have improved since they embraced the sun movement. Uh, it, in terms of challenges, uh, all countries in the room agreed that resources and capacities remain challenging. Um, there is need to work towards sustaining uh, the unified commitment that now we are countries are enjoying. And the different national systems we have in place need to be protected so that we avoid setting up parallel structures which will, in the end, disempower our own structures and are also put at risk the element of sustainability. Uh, tracking of financing for nutrition was also highlighted as a challenge. Chairperson, in terms of next steps, it was agreed that we need to continue to share and learn we need to consolidate uh, our successes and our efforts, and we need to work together under the Sun Movement, be more supportive of each other, and engage other actors like the civil society, the academia, private sector, and parliament in order to ensure that as we work with them, they also uphold the Sun principles. It was agreed that going forward, we need to engage more, especially at a community level, cascade action towards the local level with a, so, as, so as to ensure resilience and sustainability. We need to improve M&E for nutrition and ensure that this framework support the national plans. And also going forward, we need to use and consolidate generation of evidence. The role of women as, women, as change agents was also emphasized. Thank you, Chairperson. Maureen, thank you so much. That was a really interesting report about, I think, the practical lived experience of uh, many countries in, in, of the Sun Movement. Next is Mark. I'm not sure which group you were talking about. Uh, the fortification. Fortification. Ah, how could I? I might have, I might have guessed that. <laughs> this is an accident. <laughs> um, so we had a, a packed uh, session and very engaged uh, on this issue. And first, really taking stock of the progress that we'd made so far. Um, you know, we have 140 countries now that iodize salt, uh, about 83 countries that have mandated at least one type of uh, cereal grain fortification, about 20 countries that have large scale edible oil fortification programs. So quite uh, a lot of progress has been made over the last, uh, last two decades. But we also uh, looked at this fortification really was one of the areas where business has played uh, a fundamentally important role in the progress, process of scaling up uh, nutrition over the last decades, uh, something to remind the um, Global Nutrition Report about, I think. 
But also, it's one of the areas where we really have the first and probably the most multi-stakeholder partnerships today in nutrition in, in many countries. And it is uh, a, an area where we have uh, a very strong evidence base of impacts uh, at scale on different micronutrient deficiencies. And I think we also uh, acknowledged in the, in, the, in the meeting that this, there's really strong uh, and very um, uh, influential information, you know, on the cost effectiveness and the return on, on investment of fortification from the, the Copenhagen consensus and others. We talked a bit about the progress of the recent Arusha summit uh, on fortification uh, last month uh, that was uh, hosted by the government of Tanzania and, and GAIN and brought and co-hosted by a whole range of international partners, including, uh, including the Sun, which brought about 450 stakeholders together, uh, about 30 government delegations, from, and, and overall, um, probably the biggest uh, meeting ever held on fortification. And out of that uh, meeting, the Arusha, the Arusha Statement really called for you know, a whole range of things, from increasing uh, investment to continue to uh, build these programs, to also continuing to invest in getting uh, more and more evidence uh, on, uh, on impact. So in terms of the bottlenecks, um, our uh, workshop really looked at a few. The, the, one of the top of the list was uh, import duty taxes on micronutrient premix, which uh, can be as high as 50% and really translated into uh, higher costs to consumers. Uh, the second bottleneck was really around the need to engage government leadership more with other stakeholders around ensuring the right regulatory environment as well as increasing uh, investment in quality assurance, quality control and food safety. This was, was really critical. A further bottleneck was just around, you know, that we really need to make sure that we are doing the right research and that we're promoting the right vehicles. Sometimes there are very nutritious local crops that could provide, fill those nutrient, gra nutrient gaps and we should make sure that we are prioritizing those and not overlooking them. But also, you know, in our haste to address undernutrition, we should be aware that some of those vehicles like fortifying sugar could also have a, a negative impact on obesity or sometimes some of the, the products that uh, companies are, are fortifying in terms of packaged foods could also uh, be promoting obesity. And so we have to be very sensitive to how we're using this, this technology. Um, I think we also identified consumer awareness and, and, and government awareness as a major obstacle still uh, as we move this, this agenda forward. And, and the last real bottleneck was really how do we reach those who are the poor and most vulnerable, uh, who are often not in markets, uh, you know, with whether it's fortified staple foods or fortified complementary foods, and so that they have access to these products. In terms of the next steps, there was a strong uh, view that, you know, some countries should be incorporating fortification more directly in their uh, scale-up plans. Uh, secondly, that the Sun really should collectively take on this issue of removing import duties on premix as, uh, for example, has been done in Tanzania under the leadership of President uh, Kukwete, who's also from the lead group. Uh, thirdly, that the Sun Business Network uh, uh, take forward developing best practices on business engagement uh, and technical support uh, from business. And then lastly, uh, that we really do need to have more of a discussion in the sun on what is our narrative around a healthy food system. And what does that look like? And where does fortification fit in? Uh, where does biofortification fit in? Where do some of these different approaches? But we, I think one of the things we're clear is we don't, we don't have that common narrative and we don't have that common narrative that, that addresses undernutrition as well as overweight and obesity together.
Um, so I think overall, just to close, I think it was a very positive, strong commitment to take forward uh, fortification in the future. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much indeed. Okay, we're next going to Terry. Terry from Kenya. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was in a group 2D that uh, was entitled Tools for Preventing, Identifying and Managing Conflicts of Interest in Nutrition Practice. Uh, this was a very uh, interesting group. And one of the things that uh, uh, we came up with uh, was that uh, uh, we realized, and it was a very important realization, that the Sun Movement talks about uh, all-inclusive process. Uh, we include and we begin to work with the partners and stakeholders whom we were not working with before in nutrition practice. And this has created a fertile ground for conflict of interest. And indeed, we all know of some groups globally who are opposing sun movement because of this perceived uh, fertile ground of conflict of interest. Yes, it is a reality that where man congregates, there shall always be conflict of interest. And I think this realization alone is what uh, is making us even move forward in uh, really addressing this. And we came up very clearly to state that uh, it will always exist where, and it will be at individual level, it may be at organizational level, and even at government level, there shall be conflict of interest. We didn't want to grapple so much with the, a lot of definition because uh, uh, many people will be very dear to their own way of looking at what they mean by conflict of interest. But whatever decision that is taken that is not for public good when you are in a public office, as is in nutrition practice, then you will be, have faced a conflict of interest. But we agreed that it can be managed and through a very open and inclusive dialogue and discussion. This conflict of interest can be managed. A specific progress that has been made is that right now tools have been developed. A lot of work has gone in to developing tools that can assist countries to be able to prevent, identify, manage, and monitor conflict of interest. There is a toolkit and a reference note. The reference note and the toolkit, which was spearheaded by the Global Social Observatory, is available for all countries to be able to use in this very important area when we are engaging through the different networks and through the new partners that we are now embracing. There are challenges around <coughs> it. And one main challenge around it, uh, facing many countries around this whole issue of the tools, is the adaptation now. The generics are there, but the adaptation of the reference note and toolkit into the country-specific context is a challenge. And the challenges are mostly around capacity inadequate capacity within the sand countries to be able to adapt them. Mostly linked to inadequate availability of resources. The resources are not there, and also the understanding is still very limited in terms of the technicalities of conflict of interest. And the whole area of that sun is a movement and there is need to cascade all these uh, networks to the sub-regional levels. That also is a challenge within the Sun countries. So one, uh, the next steps that we have been able to identify is that there is need, urgent need, to carry out capacity building on conflict of interest in all Sun countries, specifically starting with the Sun focal points and then through all our networks and at the lower levels too. There is also need to be able to monitor, monitor and monitor conflict of interest to make sure that it, at the end of the day, it does not get into our way when we are delivering on our mandate 
of scaling up nutrition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Terry. Again, very good presentation. And finally, last but certainly not least, and I think by process of elimination, uh, Tahirwa from the Sun Secretariat, you are, you are reporting on, is it leveraging Parliament's role for better nutrition? Yes, indeed. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. Off you go. <laughs> Thank you for saving the best for the last. <laughs> Uh, having parliamentarians as uh, sort of the new kids on the block this year uh, for the Sun Global Gathering, an enthusiastic group of members of the parliament with us, we were able to have an excellent session on how they're willing to contribute to scale up nutrition. Uh, as you all know, member parliamentarians are representatives of their constituencies and more or less the representatives of their own communities. Uh, we heard from the parliamentarians in the room that they are more than willing to be uh, to be champions of nutrition uh, that affect their constituencies and make sufficient noise to create change. Uh, we also heard uh, from the civil society uh, of Zambia and how they've been successful in engaging parliamentarians by getting them involved, urging them to invest time and resources, and more importantly, institutionalizing nutrition in the government. Uh, several countries are now coming up with all-party parliamentary caucuses, which have proven to be successful to take the agenda forward on nutrition as well. Uh, Tanzania's example of starting to include nutrition in the political party's manifestos for the forthcoming general elections was an excellent success story of taking advantage of the window of opportunity for effective and efficient timely advocacy. With regard to challenges, um, breaking down the problem of uh, how nutrition affects their own constituency is important. This will help parliamentarians understand the impact of their own contribution and action and how they can create a change in their own constituency. For them to be change makers, they require sufficient data, they require the right information, and um, they require the training on what should they, what should they be advocating for. Uh, as my colleague Enea over here nicely put it, saying parliamentarians need to be baptized as nutrition advocates. And for them to be, um, for us nutrition advocates to baptize parliamentarians, it's important for us to give them simple, clear messages in their own language. Given that they come from different backgrounds, given that they come from different environments, it's important to not talk in technical terms, but in, in a language that they can understand. Parliamentarians have the right and the power to oversee uh, the passing of legislations, allocate budgets, and more importantly, to exercise financial scrutiny to monitor the spending of resources to see if it's efficiently and effectively spent. So it's left for the nutrition advocates to make sure that they sensitize parliamentarians to be, for them to create the passion in parliamentarians. As you know, parliamentarians are often passionate about their cause, and it's for us to give them the cause of nutrition and how, why they should be passionate about it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tahira. I want to thank all of you, all the rapporteurs. Uh, I think the quality of the presentation and sticking to the framework within which you were asked to conduct the discussions, very, very helpful, and also for respecting the time. And just to put this in context, in the wider context, the, the, the structure of these workshops were, were, were desi was designed uh, to match the ongoing work within SUN of the communities of practice. There are a number of communities of practice which have been working over the last 18 months. The whole purpose of these is to pro provide better learning from the experience of some countries and sharing that learning across countries. So this is all, you know, really a, an output of that process and an output that will be an input into the work that now will continue on the, the developing the roadmap uh, for Sun for the next uh, five years, and the roadmap itself, obviously, to reflect, uh, to be to be drawn up within the parameters of the strategy. Just to repeat again, what we've been engaged in over the last number of months are basically three things, at at the overall level of the Sun, the development of the strategy, and now the next months will involve the development of the roadmap 
for the next five years, the creation of the Executive Committee, which is designed to strengthen the governance of SUN, and that Executive Committee has been established and you know, is, has held its first face-to-face -face meeting here uh, during this meeting, and we'll have another one very early in the morning. And then the third aspect, uh, the third part of our work was defining uh, the, 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 the job specification uh, for the new coordinator and also getting the, the, the process of decision about that job through the UN machinery. And as I, I already said at the beginning of the meeting, that happened, uh, that led to the publication of the advertisement uh, last week in The Economist uh, for, for the, the coordinator. And I'll just for everybody's information, in the interest of full transparency, uh, draw attention to, I think, the two key paragraphs in that advertisement. The coordinator at Assistant Secretary General level will direct the implementation of the Sun Movement Strategy to ensure the movement catalyzes change and impact at scale. By coordinating members across Sun countries and supporting Sun networks, he or she will encourage nutrition champions, all of you, at global, national and community levels to build the momentum garnered to date. The coordinator will be a leader with strategic vision, impeccable professional integrity and the capability to harness opportunities within challenging country contexts. He or she will build partnerships through trust, will uphold the Sun Movement's core constitution and its principles of engagement, whilst working between the different stakeholder groups across the global movement. He or she will lead the Sun Movement Secretariat and coordinate the network of Sun Government focal points the movement's network, networks of supporters and the providers of assistance to countries. The appointment is for two years with a possible extension. So that's the task ahead of the person who will eventually be appointed to that post. I think it's in all of our interest that this uh, advertisement attracts the best possible field of candidates and uh, we would encourage any of you who believe that you know somebody that would fit the bill for this post to encourage them uh, to consider putting their names forward. And after that, the process of recruitment will take place and hopefully will be concluded uh, towards the end of the year. So that's, if you like, the end of our official business to, 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 for today. It's been a, another very full day. And we now, uh, as we did some of us last evening, uh, have the opportunity uh, to relax this evening. And that is going to take the form of a reception for those of you who are able to attend. And the reception will take place in the Palazzo Clerici, which is near the centre of town. There will be buses leaving from outside uh, the, this, the convention centre here from between 6 and 8, 6 and 6.30. Um, and the drop-off stop is located 350 metres from the Palazzo Clerici. And we will have staff to guide you there, those 350 yards, so hopefully nobody will get lost. There won't be buses uh, returning to here. So, uh, as my notes discover, uh, uh, inform me, you will be required to find your own way home. Uh, so that's perhaps not an unreasonable uh, <laughs> suggestion at the end of a long day. People will want to find their own way home at different times. But again, thank you all of you for both your attention and participation during the course of another long day. We will resume uh, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock with another, I think, very interesting uh, plenary session, uh, with the title of which is Making Accountability Relevant for People's Nutrition 
featuring the 2015 Global Nutrition Report. Uh, that that will, uh, session will be moderated by Emorn, who, ha who was a, a critical player in developing that report. We will have the great pleasure of having uh, it presented to us by Lawrence Haddad, who is expected in this evening. And I think, again, for I, you heard me already praising this report in the, this morning, I think you'll find you'll get a further uh, clear impression of the quality of this work during the presentation tomorrow. So I wish you all a, a wonderful evening, and again, thank you for your attention and presence today. Thank you.